Hello and welcome to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Baracco Eddy. With me tonight are two physicians, Dr. Roger Orth and Dr. Rick Newman. And tonight's topic is fatty liver, a national epidemic. We're gonna be talking about fatty liver in lots of detail tonight. So uh, if you have any questions or anything like that, watch us. We're gonna have a lot of answers for you this evening. It's gonna be a great program. If you have questions later in the program, we'll try and get some of those questions answered on the air. But we're gonna start off by giving you an awful lot of information. So tonight, again, we're talking about fatty liver. Dr. Orth, it's always great to get started with you and an introduction and well, thank where you, we Angela. go from here. Angela, thank you so much. Uh, I'm glad to be back uh, and I'm reminded of the times we've had together. Thank you for getting a babysitter again. <laughs> um, but anyway, I thought it would be fun because Dr. Newman is excited about some things and we've all become excited down at the endoscopy center about some of the work that he's doing with the liver. So I just wanted to say what it is and why we're doing something. Angela's father, uh, Dr. Baracco, many years ago was like the big cheese down at Sacred and we would have different lectures we had to do and back in the 80s. And a, a problem that would be rare back then was fatty liver that turned into cirrhosis. We might even do the grand rounds for the hospital staff. And today, that problem has become so prevalent, so widespread, that it's everyday life. And I'll just say that it was within the last few months I've had a child in high school wh who, after a bit of evaluation, identified that at 15 she had cirrhosis, and it's from fatty liver. And she's in high school. And we had my last case of the day on my clinic yesterday is a person I hadn't seen in 10 years, and guess what? Uh, she has cirrhosis from fatty liver, and yet she's, both of these have had normal tests of the blood. And so if something this common is occurring, then you would think, well, there must be some solutions. And for the longest time, we just made the note that you should eat better and, and life will go on. But there are paradigms that change in medicine. And that's one of the things we like about uh, being active in practice is that you, you change things. You notice what's coming because luck does favor the prepared mind, as you've all heard us say before. And there are things that are now newer and that's really what Rick's going to tell us a little bit about because the fatty liver that we've been saying, oh, and you have fatty liver, you should be more careful. I'm going to have Rick answering some questions for us today because we also now have some solutions. And in the past, we didn't have the solution. And the gastroenterology group here has been so active that we are actually leading the list for the region uh, for trying to deal with fatty liver because we have some drug uh, options that were never available. Isn't that right, Rick? That's correct. And what have you got cooking now? Well, we've, um, we have, as Dr. Orth was saying, fatty liver is um, it's, um, predicted to become the most common cause for liver transplant in the United States over the next decade or two. And um, we're a little bit ahead of things here in the South. In the South, uh, the predictions that are nationwide, we're already experiencing them, them here in the South. It's, it's, um, it's not uncommon that I'll see two to five patients per day with either um, cirrhosis due to fatty liver disease or fatty liver disease that has not yet progressed to cirrhosis. So it's a huge, uh, a, a, a huge problem that, that we're dealing with. Uh, absolutely. It, in my clinic, it's the same deal. And when I mentioned that when you have children in high school that the pediatricians are calling up and saying, do you mind if I write this up? Mm -hmm. And I'm going, wow, you know, this is so common now. And then all of a sudden, people have, have to start and think, you know, this is actually important. It, it is important. And, and it's quite a few, what percentage would you say of Americans have fatty liver overall? So it's, it's stated that between 20 and 30 percent of uh, the U.S. adult population um, actually has what we call non-alcoholic -al fatty liver disease. And, um, and that's a condition usually associated with, um, with obesity, um, commonly associated with diabetes and what we call the metabolic syndrome. Um, and again, it's called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease because it looks a lot like, um, like alcoholic liver disease, but yet it has nothing to do with alcohol. And um, so 20 to 30 percent of the population has this condition of, an, of too much accumulated fat in the liver. Now the problem is, is that a subset of those people 
I'm about 5%, 5 to 10% of the US population. The, the fat in the liver is actually causing inflammation and the inflammation can lead to what we call fibrosis or scar tissue. And in its extreme form, fibrosis is called cirrhosis. And um, as, as gastroenterologists and liver doctors, um, our goal is, is to prevent that from happening. Yeah, and it, I want to remind you, you've obviously heard on our shows so many times that, that colon cancer turns out to be 5 6% of Americans, and then we have this whole business of everyone wants to get a colon test of some sort, and we've reviewed this before, but that's 5%. It turns out 5% of the Americans are going to get the same deal, but it'll be your liver. And this is this latent time bomb. And, and it's also interesting, this is not just paralleling the obesity epidemic. It, if you have fatty liver, it has increased uh, many fold uh, since 1983 or 84, but the actual incidence of cirrhosis amongst that subgroup, has the percentage has gone several fold even higher. Mm -hmm. There are things about our diet or something that's different. And he'll, he's going to talk about some of our newer options on how to test the liver. We have a, the only machine in this region uh, that is available for drug studies for the new drugs because these drugs are not available by prescription uh, at this point. But they yet. will be. But we're also going to talk about our new clinic that has to do with weight management and being more conscious of what it is. And then I'm going to speculate a little bit, as he will, that what kinds of, re why is it accelerating? What's, what part of our diet is messed up? Because obviously the, 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 there are issues here in the liver that are being manifest by the bigger picture, which is also has to do with your nutrition. Mm -hmm. And I want to back off just a little bit. I know we're talking about fatty liver, we're talking in detail about that, but let's kind of, Dr. Newman, you already talked about it a little bit. What is fatty liver disease? What causes it and how is it diagnosed? Because if you're talking about people now in age ranging down to age 15, that's something that must have some symptoms that are causing them to be evaluated. So let's talk about kind of those three things. Yes. What is it? What causes it? And how yeah. is it diagnosed? So it's a good question. So, so first of all, it's an asymptomatic condition until not only do you develop cirrhosis, but the cirrhosis actually decompensates as we call it. Now, somebody with cirrhosis that has decompensated cirrhosis is a very ill person. They know they're sick. They spend a lot of time um, with us at the office and unfortunately a lot of time in the hospital. But that's at the end stage. There, there's years and possibly decades before you get there where it's completely asymptomatic. So the common scenario is that a person has routine laboratory studies and it's found that some of their liver enzymes are elevated. So that's probably the most common scenario and it leads to further testing and the diagnosis of fatty liver disease is made. Another common scenario is, is somebody has an ultrasound of their liver or a CAT scan frequently for some other cause and it's noted that they have fat in their liver. And, and that leads to further diagnostic testing, typically ruling out other conditions, and we end up making the diagnosis of fatty liver disease. Um, now, if you want to go out and gather up people with fatty liver disease, you could go and look for people that have a number of findings that are pretty common. Adult onset diabetes, or what we call type two diabetes. Um, obesity, particularly a large waist circumference people with high blood pressure that are also obese, and then people who have elevated uh, triglycerides and elevated cholesterol. So if you wanted to seek out people, um, those are the folks that you, would, that you would look for. And as Dr. Orth was talking about, one of the diagnostic tools that we have available to us now is called a FibroScan. And the FibroScan is, um, it's not a, it's a machine that's very expensive. It, submit, it, it uh, emits ultrasound waves into the liver and it measures what we call liver stiffness. And there's an, there's an association between how stiff a liver is and how much fibrosis is in a liver. 
And what you're seeing on the screen are some different fiber scans. And, if, and the important number on this is a lot of information, but I just at least we wanted to put a slide up that actually shows what we look at. But the, the number that's in orange, you see at 15.9, anything above about a seven and a half uh, implies that there's significant fibrosis and anything above 12 implies that there's actually cirrhosis. And since we've developed, uh, since we've acquired this technology in our practice, we've, we've come to realize that there are so many people people that we uh, were telling them, the patients, that they had fatty liver disease, but when we subject them to this fiber scan, um, it turns out that it's a lot more advanced than what we had previously thought. You know, the, it's interesting that fiber scan, now that we have this, the only reason we have one of these machines, because it's not an economic issue for us, because we're not billing a fiber scan. In fact, the fiber scans that people have, and we've done some Several hundred, I guess. We have over over 500 fiber scans yeah. in the past eight months. So this this is not an economic motion for us in the setting that we're getting paid to sell you a service of a fibro scan, because every fibro scan we've done has been free to the patient. Mm -hmm. What what happens is that the the advent of this disorder is such magnitude, is so big that and the drug companies are feeling so full of themselves after the incredible success of hepatitis C and, and the, taking 2% or 3% of the population who have C and just clearing it out, curing it, similar to in the day when we had an HIV case and then you would put them in the back corner because they're going to die. But at the end of the day, everybody, that's a chronic disease now. And so, same thing with hepatitis C, it's actually eliminated. Well, this, this entire process has become such a big deal that there's multiple companies, big companies, that are making drugs that, in fact, we are the drug center for some, several of the companies, and we'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but having the opportunity to have the, become a center, and they chose us because we have a very large practice here. Mm -hmm. We encompass people from all over the country, actually. I think previously I've shown pictures of what our call is at the endoscopy center. I don't know if you can find that slide. I saw it sitting up there. But in any event, because we have such a big process grouping, Rick has actually taken the, the, the bull by the horns as he's the junior guy. And, <laughs> and um, so Young, he, you mean young guy. Oh yeah, he's younger than I am. <laughs> that is so true. Uh, but he's, um, in addition to his very active clinical practice, he's coordinating these studies. And so people get contacted to us, and because we have this very large database, now we have the machine, which they've given to us, but we, then they take the data, and then we are able to process the patient and then offer them the opportunity. And we are, in fact, enrolling some, right? Absolutely. Yeah, so, so as Dr. Orth was saying, right now there are no approved medications that can be prescribed for the dangerous type of fatty liver disease called NASH. And NASH stands for non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. So if you think of people with fatty liver disease as a big group, within that group is a smaller group of people in whom the fat is actually causing damage to the liver. And, and as I mentioned before, it will eventually, in those people especially, lead to fibrosis and then cirrhosis. And right now, there are no therapies available to us that we can write a prescription for. So what we've been doing for decades, as Dr. Orth was alluding to earlier, was telling people they need to lose weight and they need to exercise more. Because this is such an epidemic now, um, as Dr. Orth was stating, the pharmaceutical companies are very interested in coming up with um, a medication or medications that we can use to help people protect their livers from developing cirrhosis. And we've been um, chosen by three large pharmaceutical companies, um, specifically Novartis, Allergan, and a company called Intercept Pharmaceuticals, um, to study uh, three of their medications that are in phase three clinical trials right now. And we're actively enrolling patients, we have patients in clinical trials. They're actually international studies, um, meaning that there are sites around um, the world, Europe, Asia, the United States, most of the sites are in the United States, um, that have been chosen to uh, enroll patients in these clinical trials. 
Um, and so we decided to do, do that because it gives us an option for our patients. Um, prior to uh, getting involved in some of these clinical trials, again, all we had to offer people was manage your diabetes, exercise more, and lose weight. Those are still encouraged. We have a nutrition management clinic to help with that, but now we also have the option of offering some novel uh, medical therapies to our patients with this condition. It's interesting. Uh, because I, I get a chance to mix with the IHMC group, with Dr. Ford, who is obviously very focus on different things to do with nutrition and diet. I, I get a chance to listen to a lot of thinkers about different types of diets, particularly diets that have low carb. But he, when I was chatting with him about this problem, then he sent me a, a note on a, 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 which is a actually interesting study because a patient with the same kind of scan that Rick just showed you that had quite a bit of disease on a specific kind of diet, which is a ketogenic diet, they actually reverse the scan findings. Now, I'm not saying that that's the only kind of diet, but it actually, when you get down to the causes of this, and we're going to spend a little time mm -hmm. trying to speculate on causes, but when you get down to the causes, the type of diet you choose is going to be the solution, and the drugs are going to augment this. The drug is, this is not the same as in the 40s when they had sulfa drugs or then suddenly they came up with penicillin and miracle of miracles, the guy would live. This, it's not going to be a single item. This is a very complex system. But, but our nutrition clinic actually has nutritionists and physician assistants who are coordinating the, the diet for you. And so we're actually enrolling uh, quite a few people who have become very interested, not just in weight loss, but their own um, internal metabolism. The, the and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. It's time for us to take a quick break, Ooh, yeah. and I'm sorry about that, but we have a lot more information, so please don't go anywhere, and we'll be right back with more Health Talk. Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight. We do. We exercise. We eat healthier. We try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Has anyone ever said you are the picture of health? You look healthy, you feel fine, but that may not be the full picture. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over 50. It doesn't always cause symptoms, but it can be prevented. Screening can find precancerous polyps so they can be removed before they turn into cancer. Get screened. Make sure you are the picture of health. Welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. Tonight we're talking about fatty liver, a national epidemic. We've been talking about fatty liver disease. We have two wonderful physicians with us tonight, Dr. Roger Orth and Dr. Rick Newman. They are both with, with Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. Tonight again we're talking about fatty liver and before the break we were talking about some of the clinical trials that they're enrolling patients in in some of the different areas um, having to do with fatty liver, and I want to kind of get back with you guys about that. Let's talk about some of the drugs that you, you're testing, what are the, some of the different things that you're going through mm -hmm. or the patients are going through these trials. Yeah, it's, as, as Dr. Orth was saying, fatty liver disease is very, very complicated. Um, there, are, um, there are aspects to the disease that seem to be unique to certain individuals and we haven't quite figured that out yet but there's speculation like with a lot of conditions that a person's genetics may have something to do with um, with why why they develop non-alcoholic steatohepatitis or NASH and why other people 
that may have diabetes, they may have the same body weight, the same body mass index, they don't develop um, NASH or fatty, bad fatty liver disease. And um, the, the bacteria that live in our guts um, probably plays an extremely important role. They have, excuse me, they help digest food, they interact with our immune system. We're, we're really sort of figuring this out. Most of the drugs that are being studied right now are, are drugs that are directed towards um, preventing inflammation. And we know that with a lot of conditions in the liver, um, the bile salts or bile acids that our liver synthesizes are potentially toxic to our liver and fatty liver diseases is not the only condition where bile salts seem to be important. So some of the medicines that we're studying affect how bile salts are produced and how they're released by the liver. Um, and uh, one of the medicines that we're studying has actually already been approved for a different condition called primary biliary cholangiopathy and it's now being studied in a much higher dose for fatty liver disease. Um, but but I, one of the things that I can say, and we're getting ready to start a trial, I don't know if you know this, Dr. Orth, that actually combines two of these medications. And, and most likely what's gonna ultimately end up happening with this disorder is, is that there'll be a cocktail, if you will. Two or three medications will be used in combination, sort of attacking the process from different angles because it's an extremely complicated process. Yeah, I, I He's got the drug. He's a drug guy. But I did want to go back to the diet. I mean, the bile salt is an example of something that's affected by your microbiome. You've heard us talk here a number of times about the microbiome. That's your gut. There are more, there's more DNA in, related to DNA in your body, in the bacteria, than there are in your own body. There are 100 trillion bacteria. You have three trillion cells. There's a lot of complexity. The enzymatic activities of the microbiome, which may be as many as a thousand types of bacteria, that enzymatic activity is far more f fertile than all of the disaccharidases or any kind of protease or whatever you have in your own body. So how it interacts with the diet has much to do, and the that also then determines the microbiome. And so what you're eating, in fact, changes the gut. The unique characteristics of an individual, similar to a fingerprint, is what you've eaten before mixed with your genetics. And so what you've eaten has then made that interior aspect so unique to yourself that then it becomes where you actually need a shepherd to go through the, through the forest here to figure out where is the trail. And that's really what we're hoping, because uh, we'll talk towards the end about future things besides these drugs. But I, I, d I think it's very interesting that, the back to, as an example on your, your carbohydrate intake, that you have a, a whole concept of the, the so-called micro, microbial accessible carbohydrates. And it, if you don't have the right foods for them, then they are in fact get mad. They're hungry, and they graze on your small bowel and the glycoproteins that are the mucus layer that are protecting you, if they're not there, then they will eat some of the glycoproteins that's your mucus. You'll end up with more tendency for problems of inflammation. Pieces of the material can get absorbed. You'll end up having more uptake, and it can become systemic. This is probably part of the cause of heart disease, <laughs> as not to mention this, all the entire <clears throat> dysmetabolic syndrome. So as you would address the issue of the drugs, the drugs are feeding back on receptors that are in there that are as a function of the, the actual receptors that are controlling the metabolic status, and bile salts is one of the re regulators. Yeah. So the drug companies have, what their plan is the, a 30 or $50 billion industry until we straighten out which, what's wrong with our American diet. We'll get back to that. <laughs> well, that was one of the things No, there's, there's an interaction because our diet affects our bacteria our bacteria are affected by our diet. And not to change gears too much, but, to, but I think something that's really interesting but definitely related is, and we've talked about this on the show, but we do a procedure called a fecal transplant for patients that have an infection that is resistant to all of our antibiotics. So we take a donor's stool and we basically recolonize the, the sick person's colon and GI tract. 
uh, with somebody else's stool and it changes the bacteria that live in that person. And it's really interesting. They've done studies in rats where they've taken stool from skinny rats and put it into fat rats and the fat rats lose weight and become skinny rats. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on that we are just now scratching the surface and it's probably going to be something that we end up treating and manipulating over time. And as Dr. Orth was alluding to, not just with respect to fatty liver disease, but probably a whole bunch of different disorders that we're just learning about now. M many of the implant diseases actually have a component of inflammation and so you're looking for single receptors, etc. but this is pretty complicated, how this is all interacting. But the gut is, in fact, a lot more complicated than just some coronary artery that needs a stent. This is really complicated, but how did that coronary artery get blocked? Some of the lipopolysaccharides circulating, that some of which may have been taken up by the gut, depending on what you were eating, and the gut got, got upset about it and ended up absorbing some of the, of the microbial wall, etc. So you end up with this remarkable situation that at some point, another industry that's evolved, and I will just talk about two industries real quickly. One is probiotics. It's become a three to five billion dollar a year business in the United States to sell you probiotics, but they're selling it to, and they have pretty interesting graphics, not quite as good as your graphic, but <laughs> actually a little more dynamic. And they sell three to five billion dollars worth of this, because they know that there's bacteria in there. But in the long run, you want to modify your own. You want a prebiotic. You want to have the diet determine it, not a, not a couple of extra bacteria you happen to swallow or that you took a, an antibiotic. But actually, you can affect whether a person is fat also by modifying the bacteria uh, that are in there. And, and it, when you talk about the mice, if you have a germ-free mouse, which turns out they have mice that have no bugs. Mm -hmm. that, group of that group of mice can eat anything they want and not end up getting fat. Mm -hmm. But you take the same ones, but then if you take those and then you switch it over and have it so that there's the same grouping, but they have bacteria, now all of a sudden the bacteria are activating this process. We are the test group. We have become, we as a population, and this is not just here, it's, a, it's worldwide. But we're pretty unique. The United States is unique at the rapid rate it's going. And in fact, we in the South have really, <laughs> a, we're ahead of the curve. You know, those people in Oregon have nothing on us on this one. Yeah, well, and that's one of the things that I wanted to talk about. Earlier in the show, we talked about how fatty liver disease is asymptomatic until it's really pretty far along in the process. And we've talked a lot about diet. So if you want to avoid developing fatty liver disease, and, and you can't always necessarily avoid it if it's genetic and if there's other risk factors and things like that, but what is the healthiest type of diet for someone who wants to avoid fatty liver disease or to have a, the healthiest liver that you can? Well, probably the simplest thing that I can say is it's, is it's related to your BMI. And BMI is a complicated way of stating your weight. And it basically corrects for the fact that some people are tall and some people are short. Um, but it's really, really, if you want to prevent fatty liver disease, stay thin. We do see people with fatty liver disease, including the bad type called NASH, that are thin. So it's not a pure story. But if you, if you, uh, if you want to protect yourself, is the best thing that you can do is, is, is definitely to keep your BMI down and stay thin. And you can say the same thing about type 2 diabetes. Um, and high cholesterol and probably heart disease. These things are all related. I think the, the type of foods you eat will turn out to be so important. And, and I'll reference that all of our prior shows are also on our website. But some of you may remember I did a show on the top 10 things. I did this for Mr. Trump the first month he was in, <laughs> but he got distracted. <laughs> but it was the top 10 things that do for the health care problem, because I had mm -hmm. also done several shows for Mr. Obama on what he was up to. And so I did one for Mr. Trump. But none of mine had to do with the actual Obamacare, how, who splits up the pie. But one of my main ones was to change the American diet so mm -hmm. that, the eight, the, that the agriculture department is not determining the numbers of people who actually need to consume the health care. We are in a health care crisis now financially for the country, 
But the real way that the government needs to deal with this is to relook at what we're eating. There are some things in our diet and it, that led to the higher BMI. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it is interesting, if you look at the non-digestible um, the non-digestible types of fiber that the bacteria like to eat that we can't eat but that we need them to eat when you actually have the the right kinds of mixture of leafy greens and vegetables and I, I I do like to eat other things but I do try to eat a salad almost every day and and one of the things I would emphasize is salad and colored vegetables that have it they have a lot of uh, the correct uh, carotenoids and different kinds of nutrients that would be in it but th this business with having had the right foods for the bacteria then the bacteria don't mess with your mucus as much it turns out when a bacteria is doing this metabolism they make short chain fatty acids those short chain fatty acids are actually part of the nutrition for the gut and if you don't feed your own gut the, the actual short chain fatty acids don't go through the whole circulation and they give it back they're actually localized and so that's why you will have different kinds of overgrowth syndromes when you have a gastric bypass syndrome or you have a colon divergence syndrome they have different kinds but the mucosa gets sick so the short chain fatty acids come from the gut from the bacteria and, and this, on a bigger scale that's part of the big reason why we have all of the issues uh, of this because we're not really focusing on the types of food as you will keep mm -hmm. wanting to bring up and, and there are some supplements that will be useful but a lot of it is to actually eat foods that are not pre-digested for you Americans tend to eat pre-digested food because it's quick and it's easy and two people are working and I don't have time for that it's cheap and, and it's quick and easy that it's, is, it's inexpensive yeah. that is absolutely. it's time for us to take another break Quick note, BMI is something you can find on the internet if you want a BMI calculator to find what yours is and it'll tell you where it falls, if it's in the healthy range, heavy range, obese, all of those things. So you can just search in a search engine for BMI calculator and it'll give you that information. It's time for us to take a quick break. We will be back. We have plenty more, so don't go anywhere. We'll see you in a minute with more Health Talk. It's impossible to replace anybody that you love. She was my, my great role model, my Grammy Keaton. It was pretty much of a shock for us when she got colon cancer. We were, none of us were prepared for that. Here's the deal, and, and this is the bottom line here. Colorectal cancer is the second leading cancer killer of men and women over the age of 50. And you know what, this is one that you can prevent. Just get screened, okay? I know how precious life is right now. We can all do this. You can do it, I can do it, I can do it, you can do it, okay? How's that for a deal? Our weight, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. Welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. Tonight we're talking about fatty liver, how it's a national epidemic and some of the causes, some of the potential treatments that are coming up, some of the clinical research that's being done here with Gastro Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola and the Endoscopy Center. We are a call-in show. We haven't been asking for calls because we were trying to get a lot of information out there, but we have had someone call in. So I wanna make sure that we get to the caller and we can try and answer your question on the air. So I'm going to try and see. Hello, I think we've got you on the air. Do you have a question or a comment for the doctors tonight? Oops, let me see if I can put it on speaker. Hang on just one second. All right, let me try okay. it again. There you go. Go ahead. Am I here? Yes, you are. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi, I want to make sure I understand what problems a fatty liver cause causes. 
it, what's kind of the worst case and how do you diagnose it and get rid of it? Okay, Good that's question. a great question. Yeah, it's a little bit complicated, okay. but that, I... That turns out to be a billion dollar question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to hang up and listen. Okay, Miss Myers. Thank you very much for your call. We appreciate you calling in. Um, I think I'll throw that over to my junior associate. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, so the way that we diagnose fatty liver, I have to tell you, ultimately, if we want to figure out if somebody has the bad type of fat called NASH, you really have to do a liver biopsy. Now, historically, we have not done liver biopsies because we couldn't do anything about the results other than to tell the person to lose weight and eat better and exercise more. And they would get mad when we'd say, you have NASH, you need to lose weight and exercise more. And they'd say, couldn't you tell me that before you did a liver biopsy on me? But I wanna make that point that ultimately a piece, a small piece of the liver, and it's not a big procedure, it's a small needle um, typically done by one of the interventional radiologists. But because it requires a minimally invasive procedure, we look at other modalities to try to make a diagnosis without doing a liver biopsy. And the FibroScan is probably the most useful uh, diagnostic tool that we have right now. It's the machine that's the, uh, that's the ultrasound technology that we have in our research division. There are some blood tests that we can do that also look for fibrosis of the liver. And then to answer the other part of your question is, is, is that if you leave NASH untreated, again, NASH being the bad type of fat in the liver, it can and usually will ultimately lead to cirrhosis of the liver and cirrhosis of the liver when it gets at its end stage the person typically dies of cirrhosis or gets a liver transplant. In terms of how to fix this as we've been saying for the most part treatment up to this point has been diet and exercise um, controlling your diabetes, controlling your high blood lipids and minimizing your risk similar to what you would minimize uh, what you would do to minimize your risk for cardiovascular disease but as Dr. Orth has been talking about they're now looking at specific types of diet that can be better for you. There are drugs that are in clinical trials, medications that are in clinical trials that are available to our patients within the umbrella of our clinical research di division. Um, and I would tell you, as Dr. Worth said earlier, we don't charge for the fiber scan. The fiber scan is, is a procedure that's done in our, our practice for free um, within the umbrella and department of our research division. Um, and so if you're, if you're interested or anybody else listening that's interested, um, we'd be glad to, to, get that, to get that set up for you. I hope that answers your questions. Again, thank you for the call. That kind of leads me to another question. Since you are doing these clinical studies, and since it affects so many, such a high percentage of the population, 20% to 30%, that's a very high, high number of people, how would someone go about becoming a part of one of these clinical trials? Do they just call the office and say, hey, I want to participate? No, what, no, what's the a, process? Okay, so, so again, from a practical standpoint, what will typically happen, it's such a common problem that we haven't had to go out and try to gather up people with fatty liver disease. Within our own practice, we have, we have so many people with this condition. So again, we'll typically identify somebody either with lab work that was done for a different reason, an ultrasound. Uh, patients are frequently sent to us by one of their primary care physicians because their liver enzymes were elevated. Um, we identify people with fatty liver disease. Our, our goal then is, is to figure out whether they have NASH, because NASH, again, is that bad type of fat that leads to scar tissue and cirrhosis. And the tool that we're using to separate the people with fat that seems to be not so harmful in that person from those that have NASH is the fiber scan. So within our practice, we will, we will basically send anybody that we have that has fatty liver disease, we'll send them for a fiber scan. And that allows us to separate those people out that we're worried about and those that we're not worried, that we're not so worried about. And the people that you're not so worried about with a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Correct. You still suggest for them, so it doesn't develop into anything worse, a healthy diet, exercise, Watch your BMI. Correct. Those kinds of things. They're Correct. still they're still at risk. A, certain, and, a, a, a measurable percentage of everyone with a non, without the the advanced NASH, so to speak, but a measurable percentage of them every year turn into correct the the problem of steatohepatitis, which then it becomes 
cirrhosis over a certain time frame. We don't forget yeah. about them. So we, we follow, we follow so up. You, it, it turns out it's a lot of people. It's a, really a lot of people. And so that's one reason we're doing a show tonight, because we actually have something other than just to talk about another polyp. Uh, because we, and I'm, I'm not sure we'll do it with the staff we have just now, because it, as we scale up on our nutrition clinic and we have more of this mixture, we'll also be spending more time talking about the other theoretical components of the diet. And so our nutritionists and, our, and the, the uh, nurse practitioner who's coordinating a lot of the diet will go over which foods are the right foods. Mm -hmm. And how did we get there in the first place? And, and you, know, you might find out that you should eat more fish, not fried fish, by the way, but uh, you should eat more fish, you should eat your leafy greens, you should have certain kinds of vitamins, you would avoid certain other kinds of foods, um, and there's a whole list of things. But if you once identify that you have NASH, and remember, everyone here, 20% of everyone we're talking to, and actually in Pensacola it might be 30, but 20 to 30 percent of everyone in this audience will have NASH. It's amazing. This is a lot of people. It's a lot of people. We've had another call come in. Do you want to try and get another call? Mm -hmm. See where that goes. All right. We're going to get you on the air, try and get you on speaker here as well. Hello, and thank you for calling. Do you have a question or a comment for the doctors tonight? And I hear the yeah. TV in the background. If you turn that down, that'll make it a little bit easier. Yes. Yeah. All right, once you turn the TV down, then we are ready for you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, well, I've been diagnosed with fatty liver disease. Oh, can you still hear me? Yes. yes. No, okay, lot, I've been diagnosed does. with fatty liver, fatty liver disease, and I'm going for the the blood blood test and a CAT scan because they actually saw in the ultrasound a cyst in my liver. So they're going for the CAT scan on the 19th. But after the after I get all those results back, when can I go for the fibroid scan? Well, uh, I, I'm going to assume for a minute that everyone in the world is our patient because we are speaking to the entire <laughs> world. Gastroenterology Associates, which is part of a, a very large GI network, we're the ones coordinating that. If you actually, if you as as large of a program as the only other fiber scan I know of in the region is in Mobile, and they're not doing anything with fatty liver because they're busy with hepatitis. Uh, so we, we have that at our group, but if you are in fact in our practice, then your doctor is one of our associates and they will get you that fiber scan set up in the next two or three weeks. But if your bottom line is that the cyst is, is a CAT scan finding, that cyst is of very little consequence most likely. They're, they're looking a little further. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that the findings on the fibro scan, that is a big consequence. And if you turn out to be on that weighted scale that he was showing on the fibro scan, now you've suddenly become a real patient, not just a sort of interesting gut person. So your doctor would just send you over. And if you're okay. at another clinic, you can, I don't know, can we do a fibro scan? I'm with y'all. I'm with the gastroenterologist. Okay, but well, I just want to ask a question. Mm -hmm. What if somebody is over at one of the other epi centers? Can it, so, how do we handle that? Because you told me the other day that we're you're working with the guys in Mobile at USA, Correct. that we may start doing their fibro, their, their scans and their Correct. follow up for their fatty livers. And is that not true? I mean, we, we can, you don't have to actually belong to any one part of the tribe. I mean, this is, this is a whole <laughs> grouping problem. No, you're absolutely right. And if, if your physician contacts our office and says that they have a patient with, um, with fatty liver disease, and communicates that to us, we will get that person set up for a fiber scan in our research division. They don't have to be an established patient with us. Right. And I, I want to also mention that in our practice itself, and, and this is what's so interesting to me because it's so darn common, but it, it, our practice has made it so that if you go to the office, there's a checkout sheet, and on the checkout sheet there's an overlying colorful piece of paper on a hundred percent of patients and so the doctor in question or the physician assistant in question is actually having t the opportunity right then and there to put your name and, and your birth date and boom somebody will contact you that's how we and just we just got this thing and we all of a sudden have have all these scans done and it, it's showing up like crazy that's why I thought I'd do the show so it sounds like you are on track to have the fibro scan done as part of your regular treatment so 
Yeah, just smile okay. and say I'm ready for my fiber <laughs> scan and chat with Dr. Okay. And and one other one other thing, just for some real numbers. The last time I looked at it, we had done um, slightly over 500 fiber scans, and um, and 40 percent of those scans um, were abnormal to the point that the that the uh, scans indicated that the person had significant fibrosis. Okay. Wow. Now, if you look at an, if you look at, we have a, a, a sister practice up in uh, Tennessee, and for them it's about 25 percent. Um, for us here in Pensacola, and we're not talking about small numbers, we're talking about over 500 fiber scans. Um, 40 percent um, look like they have liver damage, as demonstrated by the uh, by the presence of fibrosis. So um, it's a, as I was mentioning earlier, we've actually been very, very surprised. And you know, you may say, well, why didn't we pick up on this last year or two years ago? And the reason is, is pretty clear. We weren't doing liver biopsies on people mm -hmm. because there was nothing we could do for it other than to tell them to lose, right. to lose weight and exercise. Now that we have this tool, which tries to get as close as you can to a liver biopsy without doing a liver biopsy, and we have something to offer people that have an abnormal fiber scan. So if it sounds like uh, this is a, a, a new diagnostic tool for a condition that's been going on for a long time, that's absolutely correct. And, and sometime in the next few years, we're hoping that some of these medicines will come to fruition and we'll actually have the ability to prescribe medications to help people along the way with this condition. I, I wanna mention this concept that when I see a person in having- I wanna make sure. Did we answer your question? And I thank you so much for your call. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, that hundred percent of patients, as as I, I you know, having many th thousands, if not tens of thousands, of people that I'm dealing with over thirty some years. The, one of the better parts of Obamacare, frankly, was that we ended up going electronic medical record. We have three or four full time uh, people who are doing information technology for our group alone, and that group has made this electronic record. And, and as a person who has patients who will date back to the 80s, in fact, I can look at a chart, and I'm seeing the same people since 30 years. Every single one of their x-rays is in there. So I will then thumb through it. So it takes nothing while I'm doing my deal of whatever I'm looking for their current complaint. And I look back and I say, oh, you know, eight years ago, this one had fatty liver. Let's see what this is. And since it doesn't cost them anything, they get a fibro scan. So all she has to actually do is say, you know, I have the fatty liver thing. I saw that show. I really like to get it. Not all of us are as focused as our group because we're busy mm -hmm. running around doing hospital call. But now that I don't have to take the hospital call, <laughs> I have time to look at your old Rub x-rays. And, and thank you, Rick, for taking my hospital <laughs> call. No problem. This is really good, very nice, and that's why I'm lasting a little longer than Dr. Cartier. It's a it's a lot of sta it's a lot of stairs that I climb, but, so it keeps but, my liver but, skinny. But, but he, in <laughs> fact, will be retiring in June. We'll have to do a special show on all the fun things he has seen. <laughs> Absolutely. And having said that, it's time for us to take our final break. We appreciate you tuning in tonight, and we've still got more coming. Stay with us. We'll be right back with more health talk. <laughs> Wait, it's with us every day. It's not that we don't try to say goodbye to our excess weight, we do. We exercise, we eat healthier, we try to stay active. But for many of us, it's simply not enough. Well, there's finally a solution. Introducing Orbera, a non-surgical procedure to achieve meaningful long-term weight loss. Orbera is a new non-surgical weight loss procedure that can help you gain the edge and lose the weight. People lost more than three times the weight with Orbera than diet and exercise alone. Orbera gives you that edge you need to lose the weight and power a more confident, healthier lifestyle. Orbera is not for those who are pregnant or breastfeeding, have autoimmune or organ disease. Heartburn, stomach discomfort, abdominal pain, and bowel obstruction are rare. Other adverse events include nausea and vomiting. Find out more and see if Orbera is right for you. El cine nos entretiene, pero esto no es la vida real. Lo que sí es real es que el cáncer colorectal es la segunda causa de muerte por cáncer entre hombres y mujeres. Los pólipos que lo causan pueden detectarse y eliminarse antes de que se convierten en cáncer. Pero tú lo puedes prevenir. 
hágase un examen para detectar el cáncer colorectal. Yo lo hice. Podría salvar su vida. Si usted es mayor de 50 años, hágase el examen de detección. Hello and welcome back to Health Talk. I'm your host, Angela Eddy. With me tonight are Dr. Roger Orth and Dr. Rick Newman. They are board-certified gastroenterologists with uh, Gastroenterology Associates of Pensacola. Tonight we're talking about fatty liver. And uh, Dr. Orth, you had some things that you wanted to kind of start us off uh, uh, with for this we're, last segment. We're in our last couple of minutes. So I did want to mention how sophisticated some of the patients really are. Uh, and, and this fits into the sophistication of personalized medicine. Because in, in the advent of the Genome Project now also has a microbiome project. I mean, it is amazing mm -hmm. how all disease is genetic, and it's not necessarily your genes. It could be the genes of your microbiome. But I have patients who are you know, uh, getting this entire profile of what bacteria are in their gut, you know, for the top 100 that, or 50 that they could identify, et cetera. But at some point, you'll be able to notice which part of the profile you have, and then juxtapose it on other parts of your own genetic code, different parts you have, and you will have a very personalized treatment. So it won't be, and, and I'm not saying we're right there at this point, but you have somebody who might do a 23andMe, and it turns out it's the 23andMe of your microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, and then as you try to look at different ways, yes, we're dealing with something that's sensitive, like the bile salts, and that happened to do, the bile salts are active because of the microbiome that has to do with the feedback mechanisms that are built into, hardwired into the system. But it, it will also become a big business that's not just doing, taking a probiotic, you know, because you see this fancy ad on the TV, but you watch and see. There is a business now, not of just for fecal transplants for people who are having a bacterial overgrowth and a terrible problem like C. difficile, but in fact, people are wanting to have microbiomes that are good. And now you have people who are doing medical, um, tourist, to medical tourism. They want to go overseas and get it from different groupings. And there's this really quite remarkable set of, uh, of observations from the head zoos, which are out there in Central Africa. In fact, there's somebody who was actually working on getting a microbiome transplant that he used with a turkey based here while living with them. And so he could get all their bacteria and come back a healthier guy. I mean, we're hoping someday we can do this in a more controlled fashion. But this is just a whole new branch of medicine that's becoming actually pretty darn entertaining. That's what I wanted to say. Absolutely. We had a couple of questions that they brought Let's us during it. the break. There's a couple that are, I think we can hit pretty quickly. Can fatty liver disease be cured completely? Or is it something that lingers on that once you're diagnosed, you have it forever, you just have to control it? So one of the slides that we've been showing up here um, shows the progression of fat, then it progresses to NASH, then it progresses to fibrosis, NASH being inflammation, fibrosis, cirrhosis, and then decompensated cirrhosis. You can actually go backwards on that, on that path. We can, we, can, we can reverse fibrosis to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. Now, once you get to the end stage of cirrhosis, there's, there's no going back. But most of the people, we have an opportunity because this is a very slow process. This goes on for years and decades. There's this huge opportunity to, to intervene and stop the process and even make it go backwards. Which is good news for a lot of people. Um, another question, are there medications that can cause fatty liver? This particular person was asking about a cholesterol medication that they were on. Can that cause fatty liver? Most likely the cholesterol medication you're on makes your liver enzymes go up a little bit, but doesn't cause fatty liver. Now there are some chemotherapeutic agents that can cause fatty liver disease very, very quickly and can cause NASH and liver damage. Um, so there are some medicines that are, that are known to cause, actually high dose vitamin A can cause a problem. So you do have to be careful, but it's not very common, I have to say. That's a pretty rare cause of, of, of NASH. And we've been talking mostly about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Um, can alcohol cause fatty liver or does that take a different path? So alcohol takes the same path that we've been discussing. The difference is, is if you stop the alcohol soon enough, 
the problem will stop and can actually reverse as well. So they are very, very similar conditions. One is due to what you eat and what lives inside you, as we've been talking about. Um, the other has to do with consuming too much alcohol, which is toxic to the liver in some people. Um, but they're very, very similar conditions. Wonderful. Dr. Orthal, get back to you. Well, I, I just want to reemphasize about the dietary things that are coming. But we have interesting is the more you listen and you, you go to some types of specific diets, you'll sign, find repeatedly that we have issues. There's got to be some factors, and, and a lot of it might be th things as simple as there are now emulsifiers in your food to make your ice cream fluffy, or that we have different kinds of additives, or we have non-nutritious sugar sweeteners that, in fact, might do it. Uh, and, uh, and I don't even want to say that we have some millions and millions of dollars in the Roundup deal going on with Bayer, but in fact that affects the microbiome potentially. There is a possibility, there's lots of things in agribusiness that you need to get away from that. It might really be fine to make a Liberty Garden for yourself because you're the only one you can trust. Ah, interesting, <laughs> that would be a good way to end the show. We have a couple minutes left though, so I am going to say if you, if you are concerned about having fatty liver, see your doctor, <clears throat> Have your tests done, your annual physical blood work that you should have done. That is definitely a way to tip off that there might be something going on. If you have concerns and you feel like you might be farther along, see a gastroenterologist. Of course, the Endoscopy Center on Davis Highway is a great place to get started. Their website, www.endo-world.com. It's on the screen. They're so good about that. We just have about a minute or so left. Any final words? Well We've used the word genetics, your own genome, and the bacteria's genome, but there's this whole concept of epigenetics, that actually the microbiome plays a huge role, and by releasing certain short-chain fatty acids, it then ends up changing your acetylases, and these are little complicated little chemicals, but they in turn turn on and off your own gene with histones. And so by modifying that, that epigenetic phenomena will actually allow you to have or not have diseases that you might have got, might not have got, if you should have got, you know, it's the whole thing is mixed. But epigenetics is very interesting. time to wrap up, I hate to do it. Follow us on the website, eat healthy, exercise. We hope to see you again next month with more Health Talk. Thank you, Dr. Newman. Thank you, Dr. Thanks. Thanks.